The Transition of Juan Romero by H. P. Lovecraft Written September 16, 1919 Published in Marginalia, Arkham House, 1944 Of the events which took place at the Northern Mine on October 18th and 19th, 1894, I have no desire to speak. A sense of duty to science is all that impels me to recall, in the last years of my life, scenes and happenings fraught with a terror doubly acute, because I cannot wholly define it. But I believe that before I die, I should tell what I know of the, shall I say, transition of Juan Romero. My name and origin need not be related to posterity. In fact, I fancy it is better that they shouldn't be. For when a man suddenly migrates to the States or the colonies, he leaves his past behind him. Besides, what I once was is not in the least relevant to my narrative, save maybe the fact that during my service in India I was more at home among the white-bearded native teachers than among my brother officers. I had delved not a little into odd Eastern lore when overtaken by the calamities which brought about my new life in America's vast West a life wherein I found it well to accept a name, my present one, which is very common and carries no meaning. In the summer and autumn of 1894 I dwelt in the drear expanses of the Cactus Mountains, employed as a common laborer at a celebrated Norton mine, whose discovery by an age prospector some years earlier had turned the surrounding region from a nearly unpeopled waste to a seething cauldron of sordid life. A cavern of gold, lying deep beneath a mountain lake, had enriched the venerable finder beyond his wildest dream, and now formed the seat of extensive tunneling operations on the part of the corporation to which it had been sold. Additional grottos had been found, and the yield of yellow metal was exceedingly great, so that a mighty and heterogeneous army of miners toiled night and day in the many passages and rock hollows. The superintendent, one Mr. Arthur, often discussed the singularity of the local geological formation, speculating on the probable extent of the chain of caves and estimating the future of the titanic mining enterprise. He considered the auriferous cavities the result of the action of water, and believed that the last of them would soon be open. It wasn't long after my arrival and employment that Juan Romero came to the Norton Mine. One of the large herd of unkempt Mexicans attracted thither from the neighboring country, he at first attracted attention only because of his features, which, though plainly of the red Indian type, were yet remarkable for their light color and refined conformation, being vastly unlike those of the average greaser or Paiute of the locality. It is curious that although he differed so widely from the mass of Hispanicized and tribal Indians, Romero gave not the least impression of Caucasian blood. It was not the Castilian conquistador or the American pioneer, but the ancient and noble Aztec, whom imagination called to view when the silent peon would rise in the early morning and gaze in fascination at the sun as it crept above the eastern hills, meanwhile stretching out his arms to the orb as if in the performance of some rite whose nature he did not entirely understand. But save for his face, Romero was in no way suggestive of nobility. Ignorant and dirty, he was at home among the other brown-skinned Mexicans, having come, or so I was told afterward, from the very lowest sort of surrounding. He had been found as a child in a crude mountain hut, the only survivor of an epidemic which had stalked lethally by. Near the hut, close to a rather unusual rock fissure, laid two skeletons, newly picked by the vultures, and presumably forming the sole remains of his parents. No one recalled their identity, and they were soon forgotten by the many. Indeed, the crumbling of the hut and the closing of the rock fissure by a subsequent avalanche had helped to efface even the scene from recollection. Reared by a Mexican cattle thief who had given him his name, Juan differed little from his fellows. The attachment which Romero manifested towards me was undoubtedly commenced through the quaint and ancient Hindu ring which I wore, when not engaged in active labor. Of its nature and manner of coming into my possession, I cannot speak. It was my last link with a chapter of my life close forever, 
and I highly valued it. Soon I observed that the odd-looking Mexican was likewise interested, eyeing it with an expression that banished all suspicion of simple covetousness. Its hoary hieroglyphs seemed to stir some faint recollection in his untutored mind, although he could not possibly have beheld their like before. Within a few weeks after his advent, Romero was like a faithful servant to me, this notwithstanding the fact that I was myself just a simple miner. Our conversation was necessarily limited. He knew but a few words in English, which I found my Oxonian Spanish was something quite different from the patois of the peon of New Spain. The event which I am about to relate was unheralded by long premonition. Though the man Romero had interested me, and though my ring had affected him peculiarly, I thought that neither of us had any expectation of what was to follow when the great blast was set off. Geological considerations had dictated an extension of the mine directly downward from the deepest part of the subterranean area, and the belief of the superintendent that only solid rock would be encountered had led to the placing of a prodigious amount of dynamite. With this work, Romero and I were not connected, wherefore our first knowledge of extraordinary conditions came from others. The charge, heavier maybe than estimated, had seemed to shake the entire mountain. Windows and shanties on the slope outside were shattered by the shock, while miners throughout the closer passages were knocked off their feet. Upon investigation it was seen that a new abyss yawned indefinitely below the seat of the blast, an abyss so monstrous that no handy line might fathom it, nor any lamp illuminate it. Baffled, the excavators sought a conference with the superintendent, who ordered great lengths of rope to be taken to the pit, and spliced and lowered without cessation till a bottom will be discovered. Shortly afterward, the pale-faced workman apprised the superintendent of their failure. Firmly, though respectfully, they signified their refusal to revisit the chasm, or indeed to work the mine any further until it could be sealed. Something beyond their experience was evidently confronting them, for so far as they could ascertain, the void below was infinite. The superintendent didn't reproach them. Instead, he pondered deeply and made plans for the following day. The night shift did not go on that evening. At two in the morning, a lone coyote on the mountain began to howl dismally. From somewhere within the works, a dog barked an answer, either to the coyote or to something else. A storm was gathering around the peaks of the range, and weirdly shaped clouds scudded horribly across the blurred patch of celestial light, which marked a gibbous moon's attempts to shine through many layers of cirrostratus vapors. It was Romero's voice coming from the bunk above that awakened me, a voice excited and tense with some vague expectation I could not understand. Madre de Dios, el sonido, ese sonido, oiga ved, la oe ved, señor, that sound. I listened, wondering what he meant. The coyote, the dog, the storm, all were audible. The last named only now gaining ascendancy as the wind shrieked more and more frantically. Flashes of lightning were visible through the bunkhouse window. I questioned the nervous Mexican, repeating the words I had heard. El coyote, el perro, el viento? But Romero did not reply. Then he commented, whispering in awe. El ritmo, senor, el ritmo de la tierra, that throb down in the ground. And now I also heard, heard and shivered, and without knowing why. Deep, deep below me was a sound, a rhythm, just as the peon had said, which, though exceedingly faint, yet dominated even the dog, the coyote, and the increasing tempest. To seek to describe it was useless, for it was such that no description is possible. Perhaps it was like the pulsing of the engines far down in a great liner, as sense from the deck, yet it was not mechanical, not so devoid of the element of the life and consciousness. Of all its qualities, remoteness in the earth most impressed me. To my mind rushed fragments of a passage in Joseph Glanville, which Poe had quoted with tremendous effect. The vastness, profundity, and unsearchableness of his works which have a depth in them greater than the well of Democritus. 
Suddenly, Romero leaped out of his bunk, pausing before me to gaze at a strange ring on my hand, which glistened queerly in every flash of lightning, and then staring intently in the direction of the mine shaft. I also rose, and both of us stood motionless for a time, straining our ears as the uncanny rhythm seemed more and more to take on a vital quality. Then, without apparent volition, we began to move towards the door, whose rattling in the gale held a comforting suggestion of earthly reality. The chanting in the depths, for such the sound now seemed to be, grew in volume and distinctness, and we felt irresistibly urged out into the storm and thence to the gaping blackness of the shaft. We encountered no living creature, for the men of the night shift had been released from duty, and they were doubtless at the dry gulch settlement pouring sinister rumors into the ear of some drowsy bartender. From the watchman's cabin, however, gleamed a small square of yellow light like a guardian's eye. I dimly wondered how the rhythmic sound had affected the watchman, but Romero was moving more quickly now, and I followed without pausing. As we descended the shaft, the sound beneath grew definitely composite. It struck me as horribly as an oriental ceremony, with beating of drums and chanting of many voices. I have, as you are aware, been much in India. Romero and I moved without material hesitancy through drifts and down ladders, ever towards the thing that allured us, yet ever with a pitiless helpless fear and reluctance. At one time I fancied I had gone mad. This was when, on wondering how our way was lighted in the absence of light or candle, I realized that the ancient ring on my finger was glowing with eerie radiance diffusing a pallid luster through the damp, heavy air around. It was without warning that Romero, after clambering down one of the many wide ladders, broke into a run and left me alone. Some new and wild note in the drumming and chanting, perceptible but slightly to me, had acted on him in a starting fashion, and with a wild outcry he forged ahead unguided in the cavern's gloom. I heard his repeated shrieks before me, as he stumbled awkwardly along the level places and scrambled madly down the rickety ladders. And frightened as I was, I yet retained enough of my perception to note that his speech, when articulate, was not of any sort known to me. Harsh but impressive polysyllables had replaced this customary mix of bad Spanish and worse English, and of these only the oft-repeated cry, Huitzilopochtli, seemed in the least familiar. Later I definitely placed the word in the works of a great historian, and shuddered when the association came to me. The climax of that awful night was composite but fairly brief, beginning just as I reached the final cavern of the journey. Out of the darkness, immediately ahead burst the final shriek from the Mexican, which was joined by such a chorus of uncouth sound as I could never hear again and survive. In that moment, it seemed as if all the hidden terrors and monstrosities of the earth had become articulate in an effort to overwhelm the human race. Simultaneously, the light from the ring was extinguished, and I saw a new light glimmering from the lower space but a few yards ahead of me. I had arrived at the abyss, which was now redly glowing, and which had evidently swallowed up the unfortunate Romero. Advancing, I peered over the edge of the chasm, which no line could fathom, and which was now a pandemonium of flickering flame and hideous uproar. At first I beheld nothing but a seething blur of luminosity, but then shapes, all infinitely distant, began to detach themselves from the confusion, and I saw, was it Juan Romero? But God, I dare not tell you what I saw. Some power from heaven, coming to my aid, obliterated both sights and sounds in such a crash as may be heard when two universes collide in space. Chaos supervened, and I knew the peace of oblivion. I hardly know how to continue, since conditions so singular are involved, but I will do my best, not even trying to differentiate between the real and the apparent. When I awakened, I was safe in my bunk, and the red glow of dawn was visible at a window. Some distance away the lifeless body of Juan Romero lay upon a table, surrounded by a group of men, including the camp doctor. The men were discussing the strange death of the Mexican as he lay asleep, 
a death seemingly connected in some way with the terrible bolt of lightning which had struck and shaken the mountain. No direct cause was evident, and an autopsy failed to show any reason why Romero should not be living. Snatches of conversation indicated beyond a shadow of a doubt that neither Romero nor I had left the bunkhouse during the night, that neither of us had been awake during the frightful storm which had passed over the cactus range. That storm, said men who had ventured down the mine shaft, had caused extensive cave-ins, and had completely closed the deep abyss which had created so much apprehension the day before. When I asked the watchman what sounds he had heard prior to the mighty thunderbolt, he mentioned a coyote, a dog, and a snarling mountain wind. Nothing more. Nor do I doubt his word. Upon the resumption of work, Superintendent Arthur called upon some especially dependable men to make a few investigations around the spot where the gulf had appeared. Although hardly eager, they obeyed, and a deep boring was made. Results were curious. The roof of the void, as seen when it was open, was not by any means thick. Yet now the drills of the investigators met what appeared to be a limitless extent of solid rock. Finding nothing else, not even gold, the superintendent abandoned his attempt, but a perplexed look occasionally steals over his countenance as he thinks at his desk. One other thing is curious. Shortly after waking on that morning after the storm, I noticed the unaccountable absence of my Hindu ring from my finger. I had prized it greatly, yet nevertheless felt a sensation of relief at the disappearance. If one of my fellow miners appropriated it, he must have been quite clever in disposing of his booty, for despite advertisements and a police search, the ring was never seen again. Somehow I doubt it was stolen by mortal hands, for many strange things were taught to me in India. My opinion of the whole experience varies from time to time. In broad daylight, and at most seasons, I am apt to think the greater part of it were just a dream. But sometimes in the autumn, about at two in the morning, when the wind and the animals howl dismally, there comes from inconceivable depths below a damnable suggestion of rhythmical throbbing. And I feel the transition of Juan Romero was a terrible one indeed. The End You've listened to The Transition of Juan Romero by H. P. Lovecraft 